Hi friends, welcome back for unit two. Unit two is British colonization in North America. This is worth six to eight percent on the test. Again, not a huge amount. Um, 1607 to 1754. So you want to think in terms of you're your narrowing down, you're scaling down the, the content um, or the scope of the content that you need to know. Um, we started last time in unit one with European colonization of North America with the Spanish and the French and the Dutch. And now we're kind of narrowing in on the British colonies, those 13 colonies along the Eastern seaboard. Um, your guiding question, what were political, social, and economic characteristics of the British colonies in North America? Political, social, and economic. These are gonna be your go-to kind of your foundation for how you want to divide up maybe long essays or, or DBQs. Um, but if you can sort of think in the back of your head, political, social, and economic, whatever time period, whatever um, geographic area you're studying, if you can break it into political, social, and economic, you are miles ahead of so many other people um, because that really is going to help you break down the framework of what is the most important stuff that I need to know about this particular unit. Unit two, British colonization in North America. What was true at the beginning of this period is not necessarily gonna be true at the end of the period. So keep in, keep in mind that as you go through these units, we're talking about a 150 year time span. So what may have been motivation at the beginning of British colonization in 1607 or 1620, that may not be as important by the time we get to the end of this unit in 1754. Just because we're kind of characterizing all of unit one as British colonization in North America, um, understand that a lot of those ideas are going to morph as we go throughout history and what may be the, the, the starting premise for why the British settled in Massachusetts Bay or why the British settled in Virginia, that may not be as important by the time we get to 1754. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so politically, what is different about the American colony's political structure than back home in Britain? Um, think about the, the way that the, the Americans governed themselves. What was unique about American governmental systems in Virginia, in Massachusetts? Um, how was that similar to what they came from in England? How was that gonna be different? And what I want you to keep in mind is that we know that the next big thing that's coming is the American Revolution. The Americans are gonna break up with the British. It's gonna be a big old thing. So what is it that changes from 1607 to 1754 that puts them even in the mindset of, hey, let's break up with our overlords. Let's do that. It, it had never been really thought of. So what is it that's changing in America politically? How does that look different? What are their political structures look like in America that are different from what they had in Britain? Um, socially, how is American society similar or different to that in English society? Again, it's gonna be different based on the different regions. New England societies um, are a lot more homogeneous. They're a lot more sort of everybody is more of an equal status. In the Southern societies, they're much more hierarchical as they may have been in England. So think about the social implications of that. Um, if you have everybody being equal, how is that different and why would that be something that maybe people in New England might wanna take going forward if that's not what they had over in England? Um, religion, how important is religion in the colonies? We, we've all heard the stories about um, the pilgrims and they landed in Plymouth and they had the funny hats and the buckles and the shoes and all the things. Um, religion we know was super important. America was founded as one of the, one of the principles America was founded was for religious freedom but that didn't play over into necessarily the middle colonies or the Southern colonies. It wasn't as important there. So be able to understand the differences between New England colonies, middle colonies, Southern colonies, how important was religion? Um, kind of parallel with that, how important is education? We'll see that education and religion go pretty much hand in hand. Um, where religion was important, education was important because people needed to be able to know how to read in order to read the Bible. That was, the, that was the big key. And then economically, what was the American economy based on? Also, not gonna be the same. From the New England colonies to the Southern colonies, they have different ways of making their money and different means of where that money is gonna come from. Um, what was the purpose of the American economy, both to the colonists themselves 
as well as what was the purpose of the American colonies in relation to England. England allowed the American colonies to be settled for a reason. So what was that reason? Spoiler, the cause of British colonization in North America, it's money. It really is always about money. I mean, if you just think who's going to benefit, like who's going to make money off of whatever instance, you can usually kind of figure out the cause of things. Um, the British government saw an opportunity to increase their wealth, to increase the size of their empire. The goal of the American colonies from the British perspective was to make money for the British empire, to make money for the British parliament, to make money for the British crown. And as long as the Americans were making money, they didn't care what else. It was like, do your own government, do your own society, make religion as important or as little important as you want to, just make sure that we're getting the money back over in England. So kind of keep that in mind as well. Okay, so let's look at the breakdown of the colonies. I'm going to start with the southern colonies because they were the ones settled first. Um, this, the original, the very first English settlement in North America was at Jamestown, Jamestown, Virginia, 1607. Um, you will sometimes see the southern colonies divided into the deep southern colonies, Georgia and the Carolinas, and then the Chesapeake colonies, the Chesapeake, um, uh, Delaware, Mar Maryland, and Virginia, those states that surround or those colonies that surrounded the Chesapeake Bay. Sometimes you'll see all of them together. Sometimes you'll see them separate. For our purposes, I grouped them together because economically they tend to sort of revolve around a lot of the same issues. But what was the political structure of the Southern and Chesapeake colonies? Again, this is the first place that was settled in North America by the British. Um, Virginia was named, the Virginia colony was named after Queen Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. The first settlement of Jamestown was named after King James, who was the, the king who succeeded Elizabeth after she died in 1603. So this is, this is a colony that is directly paying homage to the queen and, and the royal line. Um, and most of the settlers who came to Virginia in those early years, they were there to make money. Um, in many cases, they were second sons, third sons, um, sons of very rich families back in England who were not going to get the inheritance. They got a huge tract of land in, in the New World. So you have these really rich boys, kids, guys, um, young men, who, who dream of this being their empire. This is going to be where they make it. This is where they get all their money. And they get to America and initially they're looking for gold in Virginia, which I'm pretty sure didn't exist, but they were like, we're going to the new world. We're going to make gold. We're going to, we're going to find gold. We're going to be rich. So these guys who are wealthy, who are fairly privileged, they land in Virginia and there's not gold there and they start dying off really fast. And it's like, we're going to die unless we figure out how to work. Um, John Smith comes in and says, look, if, if this colony of Jamestown is going to survive, you're going to have to actually work. Forget your ideas of making gold. You're going to have to learn how to plant things. You're going to have to learn how to harvest crops. Otherwise, you're going to die. The goal in the Virginia colony and the goal in really the Southern and the Chesapeake colonies is to make money from the land. If we go up to the New England colonies, um, the first settlers arrive in New England in 1619, um, 1620. Uh, they arrive in Plymouth. These are the guys on the Mayflower. So these families on the Mayflower have sailed over and they've agreed that we're going to create this new perfect society based on religious freedom. Okay. This is where we get the freedom of religion in the, in the history of, of America in the foundation of what it means to be an American. Um, those settlers who came into New England, they are guaranteeing religious freedom for themselves to be able to practice the kind of religion that they were not allowed to practice over in England. These were Puritans. These were people who believed that the Church of England over in on the other side of the Atlantic had gotten too Catholic looking and they wanted to purify the Church of England, hence they were Puritans, um, and they got kicked out of England for it. So they came to the New World seeking religious freedom. They settled as family units. They settled in small towns and built up these small towns and villages really centered around the church. The church was hugely important. And because the church was important, schools were important. If you think about the major Ivy League universities in the country today, most of them are in the Northeast. That's not a coincidence. Harvard was originally a theological seminary, a, a place to study religion. The middle colonies 
kind of a combination of both of them. Um, not quite as religious as the Northeastern colonies, more, a little bit more religious in some places than the Southern colonies. Middle colonies are called the breadbasket colonies. Um, they had farms, but not the huge plantations of the South. Um, they didn't have the small little subsistence farms that New England had, where they were only, in New England, they were only planting enough for their family to survive, not to make money, just to survive. In the middle colonies, they were planting a little bit more than that, but they weren't planting the big cash crops of the southern colonies. They weren't planting tobacco. They weren't planting rice and indigo from the Carolinas. Um, they were going to make money, but not as much money as those huge plantation crops of the south. The middle colonies were really based around trade. And if you think about New York City, New York City is the economic hub of, of America still today. Um, that was the economic center of trade where, where that's where these, these trade networks and these trade markets were going to spring up um, to really kind of link New England and Southern colonies together. The transatlantic trade system You'll also hear this referred to as triangular trade. Sometimes that's interchangeable, sometimes it's not. It's essentially this network of trade from Europe to Africa to the New World. Um, and think about it in the sense that Europe is selling manufactured goods, in many cases guns, and they would trade those for slaves in Africa. Um, those slaves would then be shipped to the New World where they would be sold um, for raw materials in the New World. And that's how we get this huge population of African slaves in North America. It was because of this trade network. Going back to the cause of all of this, the money thing, that's where it comes from. Those crops are only going to make money if you plant them in huge quantities. The land was there. They had plenty of land to plant these huge, huge quantities of crops, but they didn't have the labor source. And initially, the first labor source that came over with those early settlers in the early 1600s, they were indentured servants. They, they would get their freedom after seven years. Their, their cost of transportation was paid for, but then after seven years, it was like, okay, I've done my servitude. I'm going to go out and start my own life. Well, the landowners had to constantly recreate their labor source, their labor pool. With African slavery, they didn't have to do that. And when we think about the, the root causes of um, race relations in America, when we think about the, how, the impact that slavery had in America, um, it goes all the way back to the very beginning. Because those African slaves, the very first African slaves, arrived in 1619. So long before we have the Declaration of Independence in 1776, slavery is established. And it is established as a necessary need in order for those landowners in the South to make money. And when their goal is to make money, it's not to create a world of equality. Their goal is to make money the cheapest way that they can get a labor source to fulfill that need is by using African slavery. So that transition from indentured servitude to African slavery really is about having a constant labor source that is cheap enough that is going to bring in the most profit for those Southern landowners. Um, as we move into kind of leading up to unit three, understand that, that as we as we go into this next unit, which is the revolution, which is kind of things leading up to the revolution, again, those colonists in 1754 are very different from the colonists who originally showed up in 1607 or in 1620. Um, they've gone through generations of living in America, of becoming American. So by the time we get to 1754, kind of launching into Unit 3, it's a very different mindset from those colonists in 1607. But we'll talk about that next time. Um, be sure to support Antisocial Studies. You can like and subscribe these videos on YouTube. Join our Patreon community. That would be awesome. Follow us on all socials, anti sock studies on Instagram. I'm at WHS Cluck on Instagram, um, especially anti social studies on TikTok. That's Emily, and she's hilarious and all things brilliant and phenomenal. All right. Thank you. See you next time.